All right, well, gentlemen, I have my Bible open to Hebrews chapter number one is where we are going to begin at. And we are, uh, of, of course, been studying on the sovereignty of God and so very closely connected to, I guess, if we were to kind of tear it down, uh, get a little bit more narrow in our approach of the attributes of, of God, uh, we would be up underneath sovereignty in the realm of providence today. We want to talk about the, the providential hand of God, the providential work of God, how, how God works through, uh, through providence. And so providence, if we were to give a very simple definition of it, is that providence speaks of God being in control and actually taking care of everything. Uh, that, that God is seated on his throne and that he is overseeing all of the affairs of humanity. And so I've got a, a few more definitions and I think a couple of these are there on your handout as well. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce said uh, about providence, he said, Providence means that God has not abandoned the world that he created, but rather works within that creation to manage all things according to the immutable counsel of his own will. And then the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith says, uh, and I believe this is the first paragraph uh, of that confession, uh, says, God, the good creator of all things, in his infinite power and wisdom, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures and things from the greatest even to the least. And then the Hauderberg Catechism defines providence as the almighty and ever-present power of God whereby he still upholds, as it were, by his own hand, heaven and earth together with all creatures, and rules in such a way that leaves and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and unfruitful years, food and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, and everything else come to us, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. And so that is uh, a great definition of what we're talking about when we talk about providence, that God is overseeing all the affairs of, of the world as far as creation itself and then very intricately uh, us as, as his crown of creation, if you will, as humanity. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, uh, the Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manner spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, <clears throat> excuse me, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Verse number three, who being the brightness, that, that is Christ, his Son, God's Son, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and here's the operative expression here, and upholding all things by the word of his power. And so the, there is the, the biblical definition of providence, that God is upholding all things by the word of his of his power. Colossians chapter 1 verse number 17. And he, that is Christ, is before all things. In fact, we just read in Hebrews where he is the cause of all things. That all things are made by him. He has brought the world into existence. And so Paul says in Colossians 1 17, he is even before all things and by him all things consist. And and the word consist there means to, to be held together. And so all of creation is literally held together by the power of God. God is actively at work in creation uh, in, in, in the sense that he is holding everything together. Brother Jerry, this is why we don't fly off into outer space, okay? Uh, it, is, it is not uh, gravity, so to speak. It is not any other force in this world. Whatever forces there are, are there because God has placed them there and he is keeping those things there. And so God is, again, holding all, all things together. And so I, would, I just got, I got a note written down for my own benefit here that God is overseeing all of creation. He is overseeing the world. He is overseeing us. He is, he is guiding everything along as he sees fit, not by a miracle and not even by miracles, plural, but by providence. And, and providence, again, means that, that God's plan has been set in motion and he is keeping it in motion. And, and so providence, if we were to get into an argument about which is greater, providence or miracles, 
I would, I would argue a million to one that providence is such a stronger display of the power of God. Uh, a, a miracle, by definition, is a, is a suspension or an intervention concerning a natural law. Okay, uh, a miracle like, uh, like, like there being a longer period of time in, in a day, you know, like, a, like an extra hour of time instead of a regular 24-hour period. That would be a, a miracle. And so it's just, it's just there. Peter walking on water and defying the, the law of buoyancy, if you will. That's a, a, a suspension of a natural law. But providence goes all the way back and, and has to set everything up uh, just perfectly, like setting up dominoes. And, and every domino has to be perfectly in line with the next domino to keep everything working in motion. And so if we were to just look at our lives, as far as providence is concerned, that, that means that, that, that you and I are here by the divine decree of God. We're right smack dab in the middle of God's will. And so back back up. And what did it take to bring us here? What did it take to introduce us to to the Fellowship Baptist Church and to whoever it was that it first invited us and uh, who did our family need to be and where did our family need to live and what kind of job did we need to have and you know I, I was thinking about Brother Brian and so many of you guys that have been in the military and and where you needed to be stationed at and where you needed to come home at and where where your family needed to be located at and and, and so all of that and and going back generations and it, it's just all building and will continue to build we're just at the present stage of seeing the plan of God being executed by His providential hand. Okay, so so that is a, a working definition, if you will, of of providence from the Bible and from some some greater theologians than uh, than, than perhaps we we may be today. So, what, where we really want to kind of get in uh, at on the subject of providence is uh, the the relationship of providence. To, to us, to humanity. I guess that's great that God is overseeing the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the birds, and, and all of that. But I, I want to know, I'm, I'm interested in this morning, uh, how is God's providence displayed in my own life and in your life? And so as we, as we get into that sort of discussion, there, there's really two questions that will help kind of funnel us in to understanding providence as it relates to us. Uh, question number one would be, uh, does God take a, a back seat uh, in our lives so as not to be accused of forcing us? Is God just kind of in the back seat of the minivan, if you will, and just kind of giving some suggestions, but you know, God's got to be careful not to force us because if, if we ever felt like God was forcing us, then, you know, I've heard some folks say, well, I wouldn't be a Christian if that's how God operated. Uh, you know, and, and the cliche, you know, statement is God is a gentleman. And I've never found that in my Strong's Concordance. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a minute. So, so does God take a back seat in my life so as to not be accused of forcing me? Or is it rather, number two, does God slam his hand down upon us uh, completely shoving us in a certain direction. You know, is God kind of kind of grabbing us by by the back of our neck and thrusting us around and forcing every single move, uh, forcing every single decision upon us? Um, so, so taking both of those questions together and and helping formulate, I think, a, a correct biblical uh, understanding of providence with us. I would say that God has established laws to govern our wills and our actions in the same way that He has established uh, laws to govern the environment, to govern nature. Okay, So again, if we were to borrow from how God operates in creation, God has set up certain natural laws. And, and God operates within the perimeters of those laws and He allows creation to be sustained by those laws. So, so there He is... Uh, light and darkness. There's day and there's night. There's a sun, there's moon, and there's stars. And the tides come in and the tides go out. And, and there is, you know, a, a, we've already mentioned the law of buoyancy and the law uh, of gravity. And there is summer and winter. And th there's, there's the changing of seasons. There is, you know, everything that we are accustomed to in this life that we just simply take for granted. That it is getting later in the year. And so we're 
we're accustomed to the fact that temperatures are are not as warm as they have been and 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 that is that has always been since God has created uh, the world and and God has just set those laws into motion now now with those laws uh, that that's the general rule but with those laws there are the occasional fluctuations and even devastations that are associated with that okay and so there there, there are natural there, there are those natural laws that God is ruling creation by but every once in a while there'll be a fluctuation to that nat natural law uh, or there'll even be a, a, a devastation there, there'll be a, a hurricane or a tornado or a typhoon or you know whatever the case is that kind of disrupts the, the general course of what uh, a particular environment is like and and our insurance policies I don't know if they still do that but I know it used to be that our insurance policies used to read uh, in in those cases an act of God and and what the insurance agencies were uh, were recognizing is that there are some things that can only be explained by uh, by, by God's handiwork and they just they just understood what what a lot of I guess Baptists don't even understand that God has the right to intervene and God has the right to do whatever he pleases even though we don't understand it and and it may even cause a, a lot of destruction along the way that that God intervenes in those situations and and we step back in those moments and we see wow this this has to be God uh, but what Providence is telling us is that everything that is taking place is by God's sovereign will even the most minute details the most mundane ritualistic most boring parts of our life God is even superintending over those particular areas and so his, his handiwork is seen in, in all of this and so and so just as there there are those fluctuations and and devastations with creation so with the human being uh, God God operates by certain laws that are just built into the fabric of our life uh, where, where he has allowed us to be born to who we were born to and he has allowed us to live where we have lived. He has, he has allowed whatever, you know, social interactions. And he has just kind of coincidentally, <laughs> uh, so to speak, brought those things to pass in our life. But, but even with that, there are the, uh, the occasional fluctuations and, yes, even devastations that we could probably look at our life and see some of those fluctuations, some of those oh my goodness moments and I can't believe this is happening moments and you know what in the world am I going to do next kind of, kind of things and God has even even woven those into the fabric of our lives and and we still probably have large question marks in those areas but the reality is that we wouldn't be where we are and wouldn't be probably as we are had had God not put those things into the mixture of our own lives so so a, an example here we're going to get more into the Bible here okay uh, an example on the norm, if you will, would, would sound something like this. There's a person who does a certain thing because they thought about it and they decided to do that very thing. Okay, that, that's kind of philosophical, right? Okay, so we're backing up. Here's a person and they have done something. But the reason why they have done something is because before they ever did it, they thought about doing it. And so they decided to do it. And therefore, they have done it. And this happens to us all the time. You decided to come to Bible study. You're, you're here at Bible study this morning. Uh, so, some of you need to, you know, like, hey, whoo, you're, at Bible, no, you're at Bible study. Wake up, all right? Uh, you're at Bible study this morning. But you're here because you thought about coming to Bible study. And you decided to come to Bible study. And therefore, you are at Bible study this morning. Well, we should have an altar call right there. I mean, that's just profound. Isn't it? Uh, and, and we just, that's just life to us. That, that is, I mean, that happened like a thousand over times today. We'll do something because we thought about it and we decided to do it. So, so with that introduces us to two concepts concerning God's providence. Okay. Uh, and, and I, I, I don't know if these exist anywhere else, but if I ever write a work of theology, I've coined these terms. Okay. I'm going to copyright these terms. And, and the, first, the first idea is what we're going to call gentle providence, okay? And, and this is in relationship to the example that I just gave. We're doing something because we thought about it and, and we decided to do it and therefore here we are doing it. And so it, it's a very gentle process. Nobody feels 
manipulated other than the fact that I sent a text message out to several of us making sure that you were going to be here today, okay? Uh, but, but of your own free will, here you sit in the Bible study at B&G Grill of all places. Uh, the, the perfect will of God for our life this morning. Uh, well, how does that fit into the providential hand of God? Listen to Genesis chapter 20. You're, you're familiar, Genesis chapter 20 is where Abraham has left Ur of the Chaldees. He has gotten to the promised land. There's a famine. He, he leaves the promised land because of the famine. He goes down and he's in a region of Gerar. And, and you know the story. He kind of tells a half truth about his wife slash sister Sarah Sarah and and so she is taken into into the harem of what we could assume are the multiplicity of wives even concubines of Abimelech and and so in that whole situation uh, God is going to give Abimelech a dream he's going to warn him in a dream of what exactly is taking place and here's here's the declaration of God to a pagan king. Genesis 20 verse 6. Yea, I know that thou didst this, talking about taking Sarah, uh, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. For I, this is God speaking, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. But there's, there's two very important expressions in that verse, okay? But but before we get to those two expressions, if, if we were to ask Abimelech, Abimelech, why didn't you have any sort of a relationship with this brand new woman that you've brought into your harem of other women? And he would probably just say, well, I, I, I had a headache, or I just didn't feel good, or I had, I had all of this other stuff going on. I didn't get around to it. There were, there, there's probably 10 or so different excuses possibly that Abimelech would have said or reasons why none of that ever happened. But God says two things. God says, I providentially withheld you from doing this very thing. God says, I suffered you not. I did not allow you to do that. And at the end of the day, that's why you didn't. And you thought it was just you. And as far as you're concerned, it was just you. But, but God is some, somehow in, in the backdrop. And he is, he is uh, moving everything according to the purpose of of his own will. Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 9. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. There's our example. I'm, I'm thinking and I'm deciding, but what I'm not putting into my equation on a regular basis is that God is the one who is directing the actual path that I'm taking in life. And so as I'm making those decisions, I, I have not usurped the authority of God. I haven't gotten one over on God. I haven't surprised God. Uh, God, is, God is able to work all things according to His will. Proverbs 19, verse 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. And the word devices there refers to thoughts, or we, we might even get a little bit more specific, that they are the intentions of a person's thought life. Okay, There are many devices, many thoughts, many intentions in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. And so I'm thinking, and I've got a lot of intentions. What is actually going to take place? Well, well, the Bible says it is the counsel of the Lord that's going to stand. That's going to be what actually takes place. Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 30. There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. In other words, what God has Decreed, and, and again, the last couple of Bible studies we've had, we've been looking at the sovereignty of God, that God is in absolute and total control. And so that backs up to eternity past and what God has decreed in eternity past. He is carrying out by His providential hand. And there is nothing, uh, again, Proverbs 21.30 says, there is no wisdom, there is no understanding, and there is no counsel against the Lord. No one can change the mind of God. He is perfect and in perfect uh, control. So that's gentle providence. Those are those are things that we just don't recognize. That's like the, us seeing the sunrise this morning. It's just another sunrise, and this evening there'll be another sunset, and it's getting cooler. And around around April and May, it'll begin to warm up, and we we, we don't need a news flash for that. We don't wake up and say, "Oh, wow!" It's just things that happen. Okay, God is just moving things along the way He is intended for them to be met, uh, moved along. Well, then there is, number two, what we would call forceful 
providence. This is, this is more, uh, I, I don't know if this would be an accurate theological expression, but this is more of God grabbing us by the neck and saying, yes, you are going to do this kind of thing, which is almost foreign to us. We don't even, you know, like that doesn't even enter into our mind that God would ever do something like this. But we have several examples all throughout the pages of Scripture uh, of, of God, just the, the, the forceful hand of God, if you will. Uh, one of the, I think, prime examples would be the story of Jonah. You know, God comes to the prophet, says, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to cry against it, I want you to preach, that I'm going to destroy it because of its wickedness. And you know the story, Jonah, Jonah hates those folks. They have been a, a, a thorn in the sight of God's people. And Jonah, the last thing Jonah wants to go over there, according to his own testimony, is, God, I know that you're gracious, and I know that you'd forgive those folks, and so I don't want them to be forgiven. How's that for uh, the disposition of a preacher? <laughs> and so... Uh, Jonah says, no, I am not going to do what you've told me to do, God. And he goes in the opposite direction. And, and he, wants to, he wants to board a ship that's, that's going to Tarshish. I, I want to get away from this place. And so providentially, uh, Jonah gets to, to the port and, and there's a ship. They're just waiting to take him away. And there's availability. There's room on the ship. And it just so happens that Jonah has enough money in his pocket to pay for whatever the ferry is to get on the ship to go out. And it just so happens that there's a storm. And, and, and it just so happens that, that, that even the pagans on board the ship understand that there is a power outside of them that is controlling this storm and that there must be some reasoning behind it. Just so happens that, that the, the lots are cast and the lot falls upon Jonah. And it just so happens that when, when, when Jonah, at his recommendation, is thrown overboard, that just so happens that there is a great fish a whale that has been prepared. It was no ordinary whale, no ordinary great fish, but, but it was a prepared whale. And it was in the right place at the right time. And it swallows up Jonah and takes him down. And, and, and you know, through whatever happens, which is the most horrific experience I could ever imagine in my life for Jonah, uh, God has the whale eventually swim the land and spit Jonah out on dry ground all working Jonah to go do what it is. And so I love the statement in the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came into Jonah the second time. And God says, go do what I have bidden you to do. Uh, that's pretty forceful. <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't know how else you want to describe that, but that's like God telling you to go do something today and you saying, no, I'm not going to do it. And, and God having a, a specially prepared bald eagle swallow you up, okay, and, and spit you out somewhere. And God come to you again and said, I told you, go do this. And at that point in time, you're like, uh, here, my Lord, send me. <laughs> uh, some other examples would be uh, Paul the Apostle at his conversion. Saul of Tarsus, Acts chapter number 9. And so I, I love this statement in Acts chapter 9 where, where Christ says to Saul of Tarsus, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And, and the pricks there, that, that confused me for so many years. And so that's... Um, that's like a sharp, kind of like a spear, just a, a pointed object that you would kind of goad in the side of, a, of an ox if he was being stubborn. He would be stubborn no more <laughs> if you would thrust that into his side. It's kind of like spurs on cowboy boots kicking into uh, a, a, um, a, a horse or, or anything like that. And, uh, and so Christ says, I've been, I've been working on you, Paul. I've, I've been doing all, you, you, you are running from me. He was mad against the church. He hated the church. He persecuted, his own testimony, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and was mad. He was zealous uh, for the tradition of his fathers and he hated anything that threatened Judaism. And so with everything that went into Paul's life from, from his formidable training at the feet of Gamaliel, uh, to him, him becoming a Pharisee, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and all of that, uh, Jesus says, Paul, I've been coming after. You are a chosen vessel, and you do not run the risk of getting away from me, and I have ensured that by the pricks that I've put in your life, pushing you in the right direction. Uh, just one more example of, of forceful providence here, and that would be with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Daniel chapter 4, 
and, and a pagan king that God's interested in getting his attention and having him eventually come to a confession where he blesses the name of the Most High God. And so Daniel chapter 4, verse 32, the Bible says, God, God's speaking uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. In the same hour was this thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men. I wonder if God asked, is this okay if we do this? Or Nebuchadnezzar, do you mind? Are you? Does your will line up with this, Nebuchadnezzar, to drive you out from the palace and your kingdom as an emperor? To make you live as a wild beast, to eat grass, to have the dew, and, and for seven times, seven years, if you will, pass over your life. Nebuchadnezzar, do you mind if I do that to you? And God never questions him. Uh, the Bible goes on and says that his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. And at the end of that, Nebuchadnezzar does exactly what God wanted him to do. He lifted his voice and he blessed the name of the Most High God. Uh, again, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith says, and this is paragraph 3, God in his ordinary providence maketh use of means yet is free to work without, above, and against them. Okay, and, and I want to close this morning by, by just looking at those four things there. There's four things mentioned in that paragraph. In, in God's providential work, He uses means, and, and the expression use of means refers to what is a natural cause or a natural effort. And so, and so the confession of faith there recognizes that God uses means. He uses natural causes and efforts. But he also works without natural cause. He works above natural cause. And he works even against natural cause. Okay? So let me just give you uh, an example of each of those. And, and we'll finish up this morning, gentlemen. Okay? So God uses, he uses means to carry out his providence. He uses natural causes or natural efforts. In Acts chapter 27, uh, Paul is on board of a ship. And, and it meets up with a horrific storm. They fear that any of them are going to live. Some of them are thinking about abandoning ship. An angel of the Lord stands by the Apostle Paul, assures him that there's going to be no loss of life. But verse number 31, here's a stipulation in Acts 27. Uh, except they abide in the ship, they will not be saved. And so for God to preserve their life meant that they had to stay on the ship. Now, could God have saved their lives even outside of the ship? Sure, he could have. A little bit later in the story, verses 43 and 44, the ship breaks all to pieces. And, and in verse 43 and verse number 44, we find how God is going to save them alive. He says, swim and grab whatever floating debris you can grab from the ship. And paddle. if you can't swim, grab something and paddle your rear end to the shore. Okay? Uh, that's how God saves, saves them alive. Now, now, could God have teleported them from the ship to dry land? Sure, he could have. Could, could God have sent a spade? Could God have had a, another boat come by? Or God could have done anything he wanted to do, but he used them just staying on the ship, going down with the ship, and swimming to shore to save their life. Now, who saved them? Did they save themselves? Well, no, God saved them. It was God who said, none of you are going to die. I'm going to ensure that none of you die. Play by my rules. Stay on the ship, and when it comes time, swim. Okay, that's God, God, that's God working through a use of means. Now, what about God working without the use of means? Listen to Hebrew, oh, Hebrews, listen to Hosea chapter 1 and verse number 7. God says, but I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God. And so saving them here is talking about military conquest. You're going, you're going to have to go into battle so to speak, okay? But listen how God is going to save them from a military onslaught. God says, I will save them, I will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, nor by horses, nor by horsemen. God says, I'm going to save you without the use of natural calls or natural efforts. I'm not going to use a military force to save you in a military nature. I'm going to work outside the use of means. What about God uh, working above the use of means, or if you will, beyond normal circumstances? Well, probably one of the greatest examples would be Abraham and Sarah and having a child when they were that old. And so Abraham was, what, 100 years old? 
Sarah 90 years old. And, and so Romans chapter 4 verse 19. And being not weak, that is Abraham, not being weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. It goes on. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And so God works beyond the, the natural cause or the natural effort. Uh, when, when, when what is natural wouldn't be able to get the job done, God, God goes beyond the realm of natural. Okay, And then the last one here, God works against the use of means or opposite, contrary to what would be a natural cause or natural effort. Uh, in Daniel chapter 3, we have the story of the three Hebrew boys. And they're thrown into the fiery furnace. It's, it's heated up seven times that it was ever heated before. And, and such is the intensity of the heat that the men who throw them in there are consumed by the flames. And so these men are, are thrown in. And, and as a king peers over into the looking glass, um, he sees three men walking loose in the fire. They are unbound. He sees a fourth like, like unto the image of God himself. And, and as those boys are released, here's, here's the testimony of Daniel chapter 3, verse 27. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. It's going to be hard to walk out of B&G Grill this morning without smelling like bacon. To the glory of God. These men are thrown into a fiery furnace and not only does the fire not burn them, not only is their, are their clothes not, not burned, not, not only do any of those things not happen, but they don't even have the smell of smoke on them as they come out. That is, that is God working against what would be naturally understood. And so he, here we have God is... God has decreed what is going to take place, and through His providence, He is carrying out what He has decreed, and and He will do that sometimes by the use of means, sometimes um, without the use of means, sometimes above the use of means, and sometimes uh, in contradistinction or against the use of means. But but at the end of the day, what stands is that God is carrying out His perfect will. And that is the providence of God, gentlemen. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna come back next uh, next Bible study here in a couple of weeks, right here at B and G Grill, and uh, and and we're gonna continue looking at providence as it relates to us and our in our lives. Because at the outset of this thing, there there begins to be a lot of questions, uh, you know. And and at the end of this thing, as far as our discussion is concerned, there's still gonna be a lot of questions. But but what answers them all is that God is in absolute and total control and does as he pleases. All right? Amen.